It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Ontario's health care crisis is getting worse by the day. Over the last week alone, there were overnight and weekend closures at Chelsea Hospital, Durham Hospital, Walkerton and St. Mary's, which was closed for a week. And just this morning, the Kempville District Hospital announced its ER will be closed for the next six nights. Doctors and frontline health care workers are very clear. This is a staffing crisis, and forcing seniors into private long-term care homes is not going to solve that crisis. Why is the Premier saying no to frontline health staff who want to solve the staffing crisis? To respond, the Premier. And that's the exact reason we have to move the patients into long-term care because of the staffing crisis, because of the backlog surgeries, because of the long waits in the emergency departments. That's the exact reason. Mr. Speaker, there isn't a CEO of any hospital that has disagreed. Matter of fact, I got a, a message from a CEO this morning. Thank you so much for making this move. They're, they're sending me messages nonstop. This is about taking care of the public, taking care of seniors, making sure that we reduce the wait times when they go into the emergency room, making sure we get rid of the backlog when it comes to surgeries. That's the reason we're doing it, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Again to the Premier. Families are left in a frightening and vulnerable position when a local emergency room closes. We all know that. It is happening in community after community because hospitals are dangerously understaffed. Nurses are leaving because of low wages and poor working conditions. Will the Premier start taking steps today to address this crisis, starting with a repeal of disastrous Bill 124? To my friend in the opposition, we started four and a half years ago when he propped up the Liberals to fire 1,600 nurses. We've hired over 14,500, added 14,500 nurses. We're adding another 5,000 nurses. We're adding, we're adding 27,000 new PSWs. We built the medical uh, school that grad is going to be graduating more doctors into the system, one that hasn't been built in over a decade. Mr. Speaker, we added over 720 doctors last year alone. We're going to continue building on the success that we've seen by putting additions and building brand new hospitals in over 50 areas. There's going to be 50 new hospitals or with additions on, on top of that, Mr. Speaker, spending over $40 billion. There's no government in the history, not of just Ontario, of Canada that has put more Response. money into the health care system than what this government has. And to the Premier, frankly, Speaker, the emergency rooms are closing, and the Premier can talk all the numbers he wants. The emergency rooms are closing. The Premier talks about the status quo. There's nothing more status quo than Conservatives privatizing health care. <laughs> nothing more status quo. And asking nurses and health care workers to accept cutbacks and pay freezes has been the status quo that this Premier has created. Public hospitals need proper funding and resources to maintain quality of care and to maintain safe working conditions. Nurses and health care workers need support, not wage freezes. How many ERs have to close before this government gets it? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, I, uh, the only part that I will agree with the member opposite, it is concerning when an emergency room closes temporarily, whether that is for an hour, a shift, or in fact over a weekend, which is why Ontario Health works so closely with our hospitals to make sure that um, individuals who could perhaps do a locum are matched with a hospital that is facing a short-term closure. We're doing that work. We have done a lot of uh, work with Ontario Health to make sure that those matches are done, and frankly, we avoid many closures as a result of that work. That work will continue, but I also want to remind the member opposite. You know, you talk about um, the, the shortage 
of health care workers. It was actually under the NDP government, when Bob Ray was Premier, that you cut residency spaces for doctors in the province of Ontario. Order. So I will take Response. no from the member Order. opposite or the NDP party on how to better provide health care for services in the province of Ontario. Order. Order. Next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Premier. Speaker, students are going back to school next week to what we all hope is going to be a more normal school year. Experts have been clear that addressing the impacts on their learning and their well-being is going to be requiring serious interventions. But instead of a serious plan backed up with real investment, this government is shifting millions, millions away from schools and into direct one-time payments, forcing parents to buy their own supports. Since there have been no further details of this new voucher-style program, will the Premier commit instead to investing that $225 million into our schools where it can do the most good? Reply, the Minister of Education. We can do even better, Speaker. We could increase it by $689 million for this September for publicly funded schools to ensure kids get back on track with a learning recovery plan that actually gets them on track. But in addition to increasing investments in publicly funded schools, yes, Mr. Speaker, we do believe as Conservatives that we need to help parents through this economic difficulty. That should be the default position of every single one of us. For whatever reason, NDP and Liberals have continued to oppose $1.6 billion in direct financial relief. We did it with a $200 payment, we doubled it to $400, and now we're providing an additional $225 million to parents directly to help them with this economic challenge. All of us agree that there's economic instability and we want to help families through it. In addition to supporting parents, we have a plan, Speaker, to help these kids catch up. And it starts with them being in school this September. Normal and stable and more enjoyable. That is our vision. It is our priority. And we will do whatever it takes to ensure your kids stay in school. Response. This government spent $900 million less on education last year than in previous years. The funding promised for this new direct payment is more than twice what's been budgeted for mental health supports in schools. It's $50 million more than has been budgeted for in-school in tutoring. And instead of fun funneling that money into one-time checks like $50, $70, we're not sure yet, will the Premier invest it in hiring more teachers, more educational assistants, so that our kids can truly catch up? Yeah. Mr. Speaker, since 2002, there are 40,000 more education workers in our schools, and the population of students has remained almost uh, constant at 2 million. We have more staff in our schools, and for this September, as the Premier noted, 3,000 more on the way because our government has invested in a plan to ensure frontline staff are there to help our kids catch up. That is our commitment, to keep them in school, to help them learn and recover from this pandemic, and focus on the life and the job skills that are going to set them up for success when it comes to getting those jobs of the future. We have a vision for these kids to be ambitious and bold, and it starts with stability in schools, with the full learning experience, the life and the job skills that come with that as well through clubs, through sports, extracurriculars, the leadership we want in the next generation of our entrepreneurs and leaders. Speaker. We have a plan. We have invested over $175 million in tutoring expansion. When it comes to mental health, as the member opposite noted, we have Response. increased investments from the former Liberals who are in power by 420 per cent, underscoring our commitment to the health and safety of all children in this province. Final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to know where these phantom staff are. You know, where are these mystery public health nurses that are supposed to be in our schools? You show me one of those. They sure as hell aren't in our schools. Speaker, this minister oversaw the longest school closures of any province or territory in this country, in North America. It's a terrible track record. Instead of correcting that with the investments in our students, this government has shortchanged them every opportunity. Speaker, the Premier can ensure a strong start to the new school year by investing and hiring more staff, bringing in more mental health supports, and funding smaller classrooms. Will he do it? Yeah, yeah. I'm to remind the members to make their comments through the chair. Elevate your language. Minister of Education. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We obviously believe these kids need to get back on track after two years of, of difficulty. We have a plan to help these kids catch up, and it starts with these kids being in school and staying in school without interruption. Because every three years, families in this province have to deal with their kids staying at home because of strikes imposed by unions supported by the members opposite. Order. And I think, Speaker, Order. And I think, Speaker Order. what is most regrettable is that when we have a plan, a positive plan for these kids to get back on track, on the eve of back to school, when all of us should be coming together to support children and the return, we have a doom and gloom scenario again by the New Democrats undermining the confidence of families at a time when we should be united to keep kids in class. Mr. Speaker, we have a plan in place with over $600 million more million for this September, $175 million for tutoring. There's 49,000 kids Spons? last week alone that benefited from that support and a mental health lift and a jobs and focus priority that's going to help these kids stay in school and get back on track. The next question, the member for Nickelback. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The government is attacking seniors' fundamental right to consent, forcing them into long-term care facilities far away from their circle of care from their family. But they continue to ignore the failures of our home care system. Most alternate level care patients in our hospital are not waiting for a long term care bed, they are waiting for home care. But the wait lists have tripled under this Ford government. Why has the government not made any improvement to our home care system that would allow frail elderly people to stay in their home safely and respectfully? Mr. Hill. Thank you, Speaker, and I hope the member opposite, when she has an opportunity to vote for a billion-dollar investment in community care, here, here. that she will think carefully about what that actually means in our communities. It means 739,000 additional nursing visits. It means 157,000 nursing shift additional hours. It means 117,000 therapy visits, including physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech-language pathology. It means 2 million 118,000 hours of personal support workers, wow. 2 million, Speaker. It means 236,000 other types of home care visits. I absolutely agree that we can do better to make sure that people are safe in their homes, but the member opposite needs to think carefully about that when we vote on today's budget. Oh, okay. A supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The private for-profit home care agencies cannot recruit and retain a stable workforce because they don't offer good job. Right. Ninety percent of people, elderly people, want to age at home, not in a long-term care home. This government could bring tens of thousands of home care workers back to the job they love by mandating home care providers to offer 70 percent permanent full-time jobs, well-paid, with benefits, sick days, and a pension plan. But this government is standing by while prof private for-profit home care agencies fail more and more frail elderly people each and every day. Why is that, Speaker? Thank you, Speaker. You know, when our government passed the Connecting People to Home and Community Care Act, it was precisely because we understood that what people want is the ability to age at home safely and with the supports they need. We are doing that with a billion dollar investment and we will continue to do this important work to make sure that we are educating and offering PSWs additional uh, opportunities to work in Ontario. We are doing it by increasing the capacity of nursing students in the province of Ontario at our colleges and nurses uh, and universities. We are doing it by having internationally trained, educated healthcare professionals given the opportunity quickly to to see and assess their qualifications and get those certificates so that they can work in our communities. We're doing the work. Response? I hope the member opposite is, is uh, willing to support us in that work. Next question, member for Newmarket, Aurora. Speaker, the Bradford community's economic potential is incumbent upon the success of this road project's expansion. This road project will not only benefit residents and travellers, pretty much the key to their downtown success, and that is so crucial. The people of Bradford deserve to have certainty when it comes to delivering on this project. We have seen the Liberal track record regarding road expansion, 
like the Bradford Bypass, broken dreams and delayed potential. Speaker, to the Minister of Transportation, can she tell us how this project will help spur economic growth in York Simcoe and beyond? That's a good question. The Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Newmarket Aurora for the great question. Speaker, I've spoken at length in this House about the urgent need to get this project done, to fill the infrastructure gap that is crippling drivers. But building the Bradford Bypass is so much more than just about relief from gridlock. This new link will provide Ontario with the economic boost that it needs. Speaker, we have the heart of agricultural pro uh, production right here in our backyard. The Holland Marsh grows over 56 per cent of the province's share of root vegetables and is the second largest grower of carrots in North America. But if our transport trucks are trapped in gridlock, this prevents those goods from getting to market quickly, and it stops us from realizing Ontario's economic potential. Speaker, our government is the only government build, building towards a brighter future for our province, and we will get the Bradford Bypass done. Supplementary question. Speaker, the people of Bradford and the GTA have waited long enough for the Ontario government to deliver on the Bradford Bypass project. Our local community has discussed and advocated for this project since the late 60s and early 70s. But what did the Liberal governments do over the years? They delayed and cancelled. In 1986, the then David Peterson Liberal government cancelled the proposed project. It was brought back once more, only to be cancelled by the then Dalton McGuinty, Kathleen Wynne Liberal government. Our community desperately needs this road expansion project to be completed. Speaker, to the Minister of Transportation, can she please elaborate on the public support we have seen for getting this Question. project done. Mr. Transportation. Speaker, thank you again to the member for the question. Uh, and she's right, Speaker. Communities in York Region and Simcoe County have long called on their government to build the Bradford Bypass. And my predecessor, predecessor, Julia Monroe, was a fierce advocate for 23 years in this House for the Bradford Bypass. But even as these calls have intensified over the years, successive Liberal governments just refused to listen. Our PC government, under the leadership of our Premier, is finally answering the call and delivering the Bradford Bypass. Speaker, I am so pleased about the resounding support this project has received, including from York Region's Chairman and CEO, Wayne Emerson, who has said, and I quote, Projects like the Bradford Bypass will make it easier for people by alleviating gridlock that already exists on our roads and our highways. And Bradford West Gwillimbury's Mayor Rob Keffer has applauded our government's plan for this much-needed piece of infrastructure. Speaker, Response. make no mistake, building the Bradford Bypass is a priority for our government, and we are delivering. Next question, the member for Kiwet uh, uh, Good morning, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. 27 First Nations in the far north are air access only. Speaker, uh, these northern airports are lifelines to essential services, policing, groceries, mail, education, health care, etc. They use gravel runways, 3,500 feet in length, which may be okay in the 1960s, but this is definitely not okay today. What is the government? doing to plan to extend and improve these gravel runways. The government house leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And it's actually a, a very important question because, uh, as the, men, uh, the member will know, uh, the Premier in this government has, of course, has put an emphasis on uh, developing uh, the North because we understand how important the North is to the economic success of the entire province. It has not, of course, always been the case in the province of Ontario. For many, many years, the North was ignored. He, he will also uh, know, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, how important it, uh, it is uh, when uh, you consider all of the work that the Minister of Mines is doing, the Minister of Northern 
development are doing with respect to the uh, to the Ring of Fire. The member is correct. It's not only uh, it's not only about economic development in the north, but it is also about the communities that will follow. Uh, that will follow the, the enormous development that is happening there. We're building hospitals in the north, long-term care in the north. Uh, we're building roads in the north. This is all part of what happens when the Ring of Fire comes Response. to the north. And the infrastructure in the north will have to be improved. It is all part of the emphasis that this Premier has put in place since he was elected back in 2018, and we will continue that work. Supplementary question? That's not, uh, that's not the answer I'm looking for. I'm looking for uh, answers regarding the airport. And let me be clear, ring of fire will not happen un unless you talk to all First Nations. Yeah. <laughs> Speaker, uh, imagine landing a six-ton aircraft at 160 kilometers per hour on a gravel runway that is less than a kilometer. Stop and think about that. You would never say it is safe to drive a car or a bus or a truck on a gravel road at 160 kilometers per, per hour. Yet every day, planes are landing under these conditions. In Kingfisher Lake, my home community, the airport runway, the gra which is gravel, was built in 1987. We are still using the same gravel runway. Question? What is the, this government's plan to update these airports to make them as safe as airports in the rest of Ontario? Miigwech. Yeah, again, again, Mr. Speaker, I think uh, uh, the member is, is really, it's surprising, but he's on the same page as, as us when it comes to the investments that are needed, uh, that are needed in the north. Uh, yes, it has been a long time since you've had a government, uh, that there's been a government that has been so focused on the north, that has been so focused on economic opportunity and understanding how important the north is to the entire province. For far too long, people have thought of the north as, as a drag on the province of Ontario, but it was this premier and this government who said that it's absolutely the opposite, that there is a tremendous amount of wealth and resources in the north. There are skills in the north. We have seen it. The Minister of Mines, who has been uh, a passionate advocate for the north and has brought jobs and opportunity to the north, but the member is right. Infrastructure needs to be improved as we make these important investments, which will bring Response. hundreds of billions of dollars to the province of Ontario, thousands of jobs, enormous opportunity for all of the people in the north. The member is right, and that's why we're making investments, not only in roads and bridges, but of course, airports will need to be part of this, Mr. Speaker, because that's what happens when you... Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Kitchener, South Hester. Speaker, we all know that housing availability is at an all-time low across Ontario, with more than a million new residences required to address the shortage. The previous Liberal government didn't have the initiative when it came to addressing supply constraints. It didn't matter if it was high-rise, mid-rise, single-family residential, or missing middle. The entire process of building housing got mired in delay and wrapped in red tape. The shortage can't go on. There are young people in my riding, young, hardworking people, people who are out building our economy, uh, who are desperate to strike out on their own and start laying down their own roots, but they are stuck still living with their parents because the shortage has left them with limited options on where else to go. Speaker, what is the Associate Minister of Housing doing to keep us on track to building homes faster? Associate Minister of Housing. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the uh, member for the question, and the member is absolutely right, Mr. Speaker. Ontario is in housing crisis due to lack of supply because of in inaction by the previous Liberal government, Mr. Speaker, and that's why the people of Ontario put their trust in this Premier, Mr. Speaker, and in this government, because they know that we are here to act, Mr. Speaker, to build, and because they know that we will work with all levels of government to get shovels in the ground. Here, here, here. As part of our More Homes for Everyone plan, we're cutting through red tape and getting homes built faster. Through the Community Infrastructure and Housing Accelerator, we're providing municipalities with the tools they need to speed up the approval process. This will remove barriers, creating new housing projects all across the province. And Mr. Speaker, we're just getting started. We're putting together Ontario's first ever housing supply action plan implementation team Mr. Speaker, to engage with municipalities, the federal government, and the ministry. Mr. Speaker, as the Associate Minister of Housing, I'm here to ensure that we will fulfill our commitment to the people of this province. And Mr. Speaker, we will not. Thank you very much. The supplementary question.
Speaker, Ontario's population is expanding rapidly, with projections of two to six million by 2024. Uh, sorry, wrong date. 2043. By many accounts, the province is just not prepared to handle this kind of growth. We've got an aging population. We've got an increasing number of new Ontarians. We need the infrastructure to support all of them. We especially need it in major metropolitan cities and in rapidly growing areas like the region of Waterloo. We're so lucky to have all these new residents. They keep our economy buzzing and they keep our province vibrant. But if we don't buckle down and build now, we're going to see more and more Ontarians underhoused. Speaker, can the Associate Minister explain how our government is working to keep pace with the growth happening here in Ontario? Mr. Again, I thank the member for the question, Speaker, and as I've said countless occasions in this House, the time for getting shovels in the ground and getting on with the building of more homes is now, Mr. Speaker, and that's precisely what this government is doing. In 2021, our government broke uh, ground on record number of homes being built with more than 100,000 new homes, Mr. Speaker, in only 12 months. That was the highest level since 1987, and we can't stop now, Mr. Speaker. To keep up with the pace of population growth, we've introduced a place to grow, our plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, designed to increase housing supply, create jobs, and build stronger communities. We brought forward Strong Mayors More Homes Act, which will ensure Ontario's fastest growing cities have the tools they need to get projects approved quicker and build more homes faster. Speaker, under the previous Liberal government, too many Ontarians gave up on the dream of home, of, of, of home ownership. This government will never give up on them. I will never give up on them. Thank you, Speaker. Last week, Dina, a resident of Extended Care's West End Villa, was forced into a move she didn't want to make thanks to the government's Bill 7. Dina had temporarily ended up on a floor run by the Ottawa Hospital after they took over management of two floors at West End Villa. Warned that she was facing the possibility of being moved far from family and hospital charges of up to $1,800 a day, Dina was forced to accept a room in this for-profit facility that she does not want to live in. Why is the Premier insisting that no one will be coerced against their will when it's already happening to patients like Dina? The Minister of Long-Term Care. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, look, we just passed uh, the bill. Uh, the bill yesterday. Uh, ha having uh, having said that, uh, Mr. Speaker, we do uh, we do contemplate uh, working with uh, working with hospitals uh, uh, to make. Uh, 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 space that is available in long-term care homes available to our hospitals so that uh, uh, so that patients who need more complex uh, care can uh, can have that care that is uh, something that has been working very well in communities uh, uh, across uh, the province of Ontario works well in uh, in Markham Stovall it has been working uh, quite well uh, uh, in Ottawa mr. speaker that is part of uh, of, uh, of our changes to the health care system part of modernizing the, the health care system we've said it a million times we're not just going to simply go with the status quo it is not a good level of care uh, when a person who wants to be in long-term care is sitting in a, in a hospital, uh, Mr. Speaker. This has been the case in this province for years. I read you yesterday a report from the Auditor General dating Once. back to 2011 that highlighted how dangerous it was to have seniors waiting in a hospital when they should be in a long-term care home. We're acting on it, Mr. Speaker, and that is one of the ways that we're doing it. Supplementary question. Speaker, Dina may be bedbound, but she has the same right to choose where to live that we all have. That's right. People don't become disposable just because they're elderly or they have a disability. But instead of being able to choose a new room or a new facility herself, she was told, take this one now or next week we can put you wherever we want or charge you whatever we want. Shame. And it's this government's Shame. bill that was used to coerce her decision. Will the Premier finally acknowledge the danger and stop Bill 7 from coming into force? Mr. Hell. Thank you, Speaker. You know, I, I think the member opposite is, is losing track of the fact that we have patients who are sitting in hospital beds who need to be better served in community. That can, in some cases, be in a long-term care home. And I want to reinforce, Bill 7 ensures that the individual, even if they are moved into a long-term care facility, will still have their priority list of five there so that when a bed is available in the long-term care uh, 
facility of their choice, they will have that opportunity. But I, I have to remind people that hospitals are not homes. We need to ensure that people have the ability to live out their lives in community, in long-term care homes, where there is social programming, where there are opportunities Response. for enhancement, which is, of course, not what is available in hospitals. The next question, the member for Ottawa Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The government is rushing the passing of Bill 7, not allowing the government to hear the concerns of Ontarians because there will be no public hearing. We understand that hospitals are under enormous pressure and that we need to find measures of support and relief. But moving patients out of ALC into inappropriate long-term care facilities is displacing the issue, not solving it. The Premier said himself yesterday that patients deserve proper care, so why not in invest in more in home care? The bill does not contain details regarding the implementation and not knowing how far this government will go to free beds and hospital really worries family. So my question is, how will the government ensure that patients' rights to consent to proper care be guaranteed? The Minister of Long-Term Care. Speaker, uh, uh, look, the, the member suggests that uh, uh, that this is something new, but look, we have a report back dating back to 2011 that was commissioned by the f former Liberal government, where their own, where their own commissioner, begged them, begged them to do something about ALC and to work with long-term care in order to make that happen. This is dating back to 2011. We then have a further report from the Auditor General in 2012, which highlighted the t the dangers of having people, our seniors, in hospital. And who should be transitioned into, uh, into long-term care. In, in, in addition to uh, uh, potential for CDF facility, they talked about older patients, a decline in physical and mental abilities due to lack of activity as being one of the dangers. That's what this bill fixes, Mr. Speaker. It allows us to work with long-term care homes. It allows us to work with the patient who wants to become a resident, see what Response. services are available in the homes around their choice if their choice is not available, they stay at the top of the priority list for their home of choice, but at the same time get better care in the home while they wait for that. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, uh, having access to long-term care, it's something that really worries the Franco-Ontarian communities. Families are afraid that without their agreement, they might be transferred in uh, homes that are far away from their own home, where they cannot have the health care of a good quality and, above all, where they cannot have services in the French language. So they are afraid that they will not be asked for their agreement and they are afraid their will will not be respected. So the, the patients must be able to accept or to say no. They do not need to be obligated to go into another home if they do not want. So what the minister is going to do in order to guarantee patients that their rights will be respected? Uh, uh, the bill highlights that the, uh, uh, the, the Patients' Bill of Rights will, of course, continue to be respected. But what the bill really does, though, Mr. Speaker, it really it works with patients in hospital who are waiting to be transferred into long-term care. So what we're able to do is we're opening up 500 uh, spaces for respite care. I've talked about how important that is, and I hope all members would agree that that's important. We're able to bring on a thousand beds that have been set aside for isolation purposes, a thousand of the two thousand put them back into service so that people can have access to those beds. We're able to work with long-term care homes and the patient. What is your preferred choice? Is it available? If it's not, what homes are in and around your preferred choice are available? Will that home work for you? If it doesn't, what do we need to do to make it work for you? Do we need to put in kidney dialysis? Do we need behavioral supports for you? Is specialized nursing Response. for you? This bill allows us to do that. The regulations that I introduced a couple of days ago eliminate ward rooms. It reiterates the fact that there are no more ward rooms. We talk about uh, the $60 million going forward. It's better for patients, and we won't stop. Thank you. The next question. Member for Markham Thornhill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, the pandemic has exacerbated a growing nursing shortage in Ontario healthcare system. 
nurses and personal support workers, uh, workers are the cornerstone of the healthcare system. And that's why we must address this problem. To do that, we have to improve access to post-secondary education. Many young people want to become part of the solution and enter this revered provision, but are cornerstone about barriers such as limited selection in accessing high quality local education. Mr. Speaker, what is the Minister of College and Universities doing for my constituents that wish to receive a nursing degree close to their home? Thank you. Good question. Mr. Colleges and Universities. Thank you very much, and thank you to the Mar member from Markham Thornhill for that important question. We all can agree, and we know how vital nurses are to the health care system. I'm proud to say that we've created the conditions where a record number of Ontarian students are excited to enter the nursing field and begin their postgraduate nursing education. Our innovative approach to connecting students to nursing programs closer to home is delivering real results so we can keep Ontario open for all. Since 2020, we have um, allowed standalone nursing programs at 14 colleges and universities across Ontario to keep up with this demand. This means that students across the province, from St. Catharines to Ottawa to Sault Ste. Marie, have greater choice than ever before. This means getting them through the system quicker and getting them into the workforce. In addition, our $61 million investment into the Learn and Stay program will provide life-changing financial support to students right here in Ontario. These investments Spons. and programs are making real change in Ontario, and we will continue to provide students with the education and skills they need to address health care needs in this province. Supplementary question. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for that answer. Speaker, indigenous community also urgently need more nurses and PSW. Unfortunately, indigenous people have to long face barriers in accessing effective and culturally safe health care. With the enrollment in Indigenous Institute increasing by 43 per cent since 2018, we must ensure Sudan receive culturally relevant, high caliber education. Speaker, what step has the ministry taken in expanding enrollment in PSW and nursing program at Indigenous Institutes? Thank you. Mr. Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member for the question. Our government is proud to support a post-secondary system that is accessible, respectable, and inclusive for all students, including Indigenous learners and educators. That is why we continue to work with colleges, universities, Indigenous institutes, and Indigenous partners to create the conditions that make it easier for everyone to access high-quality post-secondary education. Through an investment of $34 million over four years to Indigenous institutes, we are increasing enrollment at PSW programs at six Indigenous institutes. This investment is expected to directly train over 400 PSWs in the next four years and will support the enhancement of Indigenous knowledge and language in students' learning. Together, we are working to overcome the unique challenges facing our healthcare system and our students. We will continue to work Response. collaboratively with Indigenous communities so that students receive culturally relevant high-caliber education, and that Indigenous people can continue accessing effective and culturally appropriate health care. Thank you. The next question, the member for Sudbury. Mr. Speaker, everyone except the Conservative government seems to know that paid sick days help workers. It helps them keep their families safe, their co-workers safe. It helps keeps our community safe, Speaker. But instead of 10 paid sick days, the Conservative government had to be dragged kicking and screaming in the middle of a pandemic to offer a measly three temporary paid sick days. Now, workers can only use those for COVID-19, nothing else. And if a worker used them in the past two years, Speaker, those are gone forever. My question, Speaker, is why doesn't the Premier care about workers who get sick with something other than COVID-19? And why are workers who get COVID-19 who already use their paid sick days not available anymore, uh, to any more? Minister of Labour. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Look, this government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, will always have the backs of workers across this province. That's why, Mr. Speaker, we were the first province in Canada to bring in job protected leave. If anyone had to stay home because of COVID 19, they can't be fired for that. Furthermore, we became the first province in the country to bring in paid sick days uh, during the pandemic. I recently uh, extended those paid sick days until uh, the end of March. But let me be clear to all workers uh, in this province will continue to have their backs every single day. And the supplementary question. 
Thank you very much, Speaker. I want to talk about Barb. She asked me not to use her real name. The Barb's a local PSW, and between the rising cost of food, rent, and her student loans, she barely earns enough to support herself and her children. Barb worries a lot about getting sick because if she gets sick, she'll have to choose between feeding her kids or endangering the elderly patients where she works. It's not a decision a mother or a health care provider should make, Speaker. Frontline workers deserve to recover from illness at home without fear that their bills won't get paid. I'm not talking about protected leave. I'm talking about paying your bills and putting food in your belly. My question is, will the Premier commit to 10 permanent employer-paid sick days so that Ontario can keep workers, families, and our community safe? Mr. Labor. Mr. Speaker, uh, this government will always continue to have uh, the backs of every single worker in this province. That's why, again, Mr. Speaker, we brought in a job protected leave, the first in the country. We were the first uh, in Canada to bring in a paid a sick days uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and Order. to update the member opposite, uh, on average, workers across the province are using two of those three uh, paid sick days. I'm also proud to say, unlike uh, the NDP plan that would bankrupt uh, thousands of small businesses uh, in this province, uh, under our uh, paid sick days, we're reimbursing uh, businesses for the costs uh, of those paid sick days. But, Mr. Speaker, we'll continue every day uh, working for workers in this province and we'll continue uh, to have their backs. Member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Education. Industries, businesses across all of Ontario are struggling to find employees to fill jobs they're offering. A company in my riding of Stormont, Dundas, and South Glengarry, Sigma Point, in the city of Cornwall, is facing extreme difficulties finding engineers that they need to seamlessly run their business. Speaker, this labour shortage is hampering our economy. It is often the case that our young people are not aware of or qualified to work in these sectors. As legislators, we cannot accept this. We need to ensure that our students, starting with the youngest learners, including my own young children, know about the jobs of the future and are equipped to fill these jobs. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, how will this government ensure that our children are prepared to enter the workforce and fill our employment gaps? Minister of Education. Thank you very much. I want to thank the member from Stormont, Dundas and South Glengarry for this critical question because as our government is seized with safeguarding our future prosperity amid global change and disruption, we have a plan to ensure the next generation of entrepreneurs and leaders in our province have the skills they need to get those good paying jobs. Mr. Speaker, the fundamental problem we have to define is that this curriculum that children were learning in this province from math to science was outdated and static. The last time the former Liberals updated the curriculum was 2005 in math. Wow. YouTube had not been launched. Twitter had not been released. The first iPhone had not been released on the market. And yet, kids were learning skills totally disconnected from the global economy. Clearly, we must do better, which is why we've modernized our math and our science curriculum with a real emphasis on the life and job skills, coding, financial literacy, teaching kids about mortgages, budgeting, credit and debt. These are the skills generations of young people wish they learn, that under our government, they will this September. Remind the members not to use props. Supplementary question. Speaker, while I'm certainly pleased to know that this government has placed an emphasis on STEM learning in schools, our students must be able to transfer these skills to real-life opportunities. How can it be true that we have a labour shortage and, concurrently, a large number of young people without jobs? The answer is simple, Speaker. Our young people, will, our young people were not adequately prepared for the current demands of the job market. For 15 years under the previous Liberal government, was distracted trying to teach discovery math and other items that failed to help our students find employment with good paychecks. We need to ensure that our children, including children of my riding of Stormont, Dundas and South Glengarry, are being taught relevant subjects that are continuously updated so that they can access and be aware of well-paying jobs. To the Minister, how is the updated STEM curriculum going to prepare our next generation for jobs of the future? Education. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. It is a critical question because what it underscores is the necessity for curriculum to be relevant to the job market. We have, under this government, created 500,000 good-paying jobs in this province, and yet, Speaker, <clears throat> in this country, the youth unemployment rate still remains stubbornly high. Something has to change, and we accept that the curriculum needs to be modern and reflect the life skills young people need to get the jobs of the future that we aspire for them. That's why, Speaker, we mandated coding, the first government in this province, to mandate coding from grade one through eight in both the 
math and the science curriculum. In grade three, kids will now how to literally build a robot. We're teaching them skill sets that are going to help set them up for the STEM careers we want. Speaker, we're also for the first time speaking about artificial intelligence, the emergence of new jobs within those sectors. Financial literacy is now a mandate. It is a compulsion of graduation, starting in grade one, learning basic money skills, all the way to grade eight, where they're literally building a budget for the year Response. after their graduation. Mr. Speaker, we have a plan to help these kids succeed and get good paying jobs, and it starts, Speaker, with keeping them in school this September right to June. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. This government spouts a lot of numbers about the thousands of new health care professionals they hired during their last term. But there is right. Don't let him shake you. Don't let him shake you. Get right down the gun. Hit him harder after this. Yep. No. Take the member, take your seat. Order. Member for Niagara Falls, come to order. Government side, come to order. That shouldn't have happened. Start the clock. I recognize the member again. Thank you. As I said, this government spouts a lot of numbers about the thousands of new health care professionals they hired during their last term, but there is no evidence whatsoever that any of these new professionals exist. Hmm. They are nowhere to be seen in Thunder Bay Superior North, and given the staffing crisis gri gripping every single health care sure. setting in the province, nowhere to be seen anywhere else. Is your refusal to negotiate a fair wage with existing health care workers, thus sending them out of the profession in droves, part of your long-term plan to privatize health care, ultimately leading to low-waged and precarious work for all health care workers once you Question. have destroyed the existing workforce? Mr. Colleges and Universities. Of that question, and it's true, we have hired thousands of healthcare workers, and we have thousands of students, thousands of students now wanting to enter the nursing profession. Today's report showed 25,000 students wanting to enter the nursing profession. Record investments that this government is making in the health care system. Record number of students are wanting to enter this profession. We know how vital nurses and PSWs are to the health care system, and we will continue to make those investments. These sound like imaginary friends to me. The $5,000 bonus given to nurses but not other health care workers not only did not represent a permanent wage increase, it continues to cause division and resentment amongst all those health care workers who are not eligible for the bonus, an entirely predictable outcome in the government's divide-and-conquer strategy. I was called recently by a young nurse who was adamant he did not want their, and I quote, damn $5,000. He wanted to see across-the-board pay and benefit increases so that more health care workers would stay in the profession and they wouldn't be working in a constant state of exhaustion. Will this government admit it is deliberately driving existing health care workers out of the profession in order to gut the public system? Let's elevate our language. Minister of Colleges and Universities. Those 25,000 applications to the nursing programs right here in Ontario. Let's look at the opposition's record. You admit you need more nurses. Let me see. $61 million investment in the Learn and Order. Stay program, which would bring 3,000 nurses in the next four years. And did this, this opposition Government? support it? No. No, yes. The Ministry. Stop the clock. Member St. Catharines, come to order. The member for Kitchener Conestoga, come to order. I have to be able to hear the minister in her reply.
Restart the clock. Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Ministry of Long-Term Care has invested up $35 million to increase enrollment to allow for over 1,000 RPNs and over 800 registered nurses. Did the opposition support us? No. No. The Ministry of Long-Term Care's investment of $100 million to support upskilling and training of nurses and registered practical nurses. Did they support that? No. no. Our investment of $342 million to add over 5,000 registered nurses and 8,000 PSWs. Did they support this? No. no. This government is making Response. the investments and providing the opportunities for students to enter the nursing profession. Yeah. The next question. Member for Richmond Hill. Jill. Jill. Oh, sorry. Daisy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Minister of Women's and Social Economic Opportunity. Our national and economic security depends on a robust cyber security system. With the recent news of the data breach at DoorDash, I know that many people in my riding of Richmond Hill are now aware of the critical role that cybersecurity oversight has for, someone's, for everyone's protection. Unfortunately, there appears to be a lack of diversity and inclusion for women in this important field. It is reported that they make up a small percentage of the cybersecurity workforce at roughly 11% of the good jobs globally. Speaker, what is our government doing to, the highlight, to highlight the growing need for women in cybersecurity? Well done, Daisy. Associate Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Richmond Hill for that excellent question. Mr. Speaker, you improve the security of an organization when you have diverse mindsets. Today, September 1st, is the International Women in Cyber Day. It is a day set aside to bring awareness to the challenges women face and celebrate women's achievements within the cybersecurity industry. To better address this growing demand for jobs in the cybersecurity field, we have to encourage a diverse set of voices throughout the field and in leadership positions. And I'm really glad the Minister of Education highlighted the importance that our government is making in changing the face of STEM for young kids because we are modernizing our science and technology curriculum to place an emphasis on STEM that will encourage more young girls and women to Spons? explore cybersecurity. Mr. Speaker, women can be at the forefront of this industry and can change the landscape in cybersecurity while increasing their representation. A supplementary question. Thank you, Minister, for your tireless efforts to support the women. True. Unfortunately, many women have experienced roadblocks as well, and, and they also experience challenges trying to enter the cybersecurity industry. One of the major concerns that the field often isn't on the radar of girls and women as they pick post-secondary programs or consider new careers. Mm -hmm. Another challenge women face is the perception that only those with programming background can get a job in this field. Speaker, with today being the International Women in Cyber Day, as what the minister has mentioned, what is our government doing to advocate for the more significant presence of women to be in the leaders in this industry? Good job, David. Social Minister. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Member from Richmond Hill, for the question. In the world of cybersecurity, it, it is becoming increasingly evident that our sensitive and private information is vulnerable. The women involved in this industry are our frontline heroes, keeping us safe in an environment of new technology and cyber attacks. Same as a firefighter or a police officer, women in cybersecurity have the same ability to protect and serve our communities as well. The industry is booming today and growing in exponential ways. And I recently had a meeting with the Ontario Centre of Innovation and learned about the work they are doing to elevate women and advanced technology industry to start up and scale up their businesses. Mr. Speaker, now more than ever, I am excited to highlight and encourage young women to consider a career in cybersecurity. Response. And our government will highlight women's achievements and cast down barriers as an ally alongside them because, Mr. Speaker, 
Women belong in every place, at every table, in every space. Thank you. Next question. The member for Sophistamine Speaker, my question is to the Premier. The Ministry of Environment has approved the use of a former dairy farm lagoon in Armstrong Township for the importation, storage, and spreading of raw sewage from Quebec. I have made the minister, the ministry, and this legislature aware several times of these of the issues involved in the approval process and have un been unable to get answers. So I'll make them here. Could you please confirm that adjacent property owners need to be consulted as part of the EA process? Yeah. Government House Leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Let me just uh, say that uh, uh, I, I won't be able to give him a specific answer to that, uh, uh, so I will take it under advisement and meet with him after a question period. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and I appreciate that response, and I look forward to the, to the detailed answer. When my office contacted the ministry regarding the use of a former dairy lagoon, the ministry responded that the site did not contain an abandoned lagoon, even though it obviously does. When my office contacted the ministry regarding the well that provided water to the former dairy farm, the reply was that no prior well existed on the property. Once again, that is not accurate. The community is losing faith in the role of the ministry in the approval of this project. Minister, will you commit to releasing all documents pertaining to your ministry's approval and monitoring of this project? Thank you. And to respond, Government House Leader. Uh, look, again, Mr. Speaker, the minister uh, uh, is uh, working very hard and very diligently to ensure that we have uh, one of the most robust environmental assessment uh, regimes uh, in the, the entire country. I know you have seen uh, day in and day out the passion that he brings to this. But moreover, Mr. Speaker, we know how important agriculture is to the province of Ontario. It's something that the Minister of Agriculture has been talking about constantly. So we will continue to work with our farmers, we'll continue to work with communities, we'll continue to work with this member to ensure that what we are doing each and every day uh, is, is highlighted, respecting the fact that, uh, uh, that we need to protect our environment, making sure that the rules that are in place protect not only our communities, but protect the people who work within our communities, and ensure that our farmers and our agriculture community are respected in that process. As I said, Mr. Speaker, at the conclusion of question period, I will sit down with, uh, with uh, the member uh, and, uh, and take uh, some additional advice from him and hear some of his specific concerns. Thank you. The next question, the member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With the GTA population expected to increase between 2 and 6 million in the next 20 years, Ontario needs to have a plan. We will need the necessary infrastructure to accommodate more residents, and most importantly, we will need enough housing. We can't afford delay and red tape. A population increase of this magnitude requires immediate action. Experts and advocates are calling on the federal and provincial governments to address the crisis and move aggressively to support the oncoming population increase. Speaker, can the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing explain how the strong mayor's legislation will help expedite priority projects and housing so that we can keep up with population growth? The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, uh, thanks, Speaker. And I want to thank the member for Eglinton Lawrence for that uh, tremendous question. I think it's so very important as we move, especially uh, during the time of a municipal election, that we've got to make sure that we get that plan in place. And municipal governments play a crucial role in determining housing supply. But the member's right. As Ontario's population has grown, housing, new construction, the supply of housing hasn't kept pace. We're now facing a housing crisis that freezes too many young families out of the market. Our proposed uh, strong mayor system will empower municipal leaders to work more effectively with the province on provincial priorities like building more housing. On this side of the house, we understand that municipalities play that critical role in ensuring our success, but we have to speak. And, I, and, I, and I, I have to implore the opposition uh, to, to really look at this. This is so important that we give the mayors in our two largest cities the tools that they need to get the job done. That's exactly what our proposed bill will do. The supplementary question. 
Thank you, Speaker. Leading voices have warned that the lack of new housing and planning for population growth in Toronto could hamper the city's economic future. These same voices have said that the top concern for everyone should be addressing Ontario's housing crunch and the difficulty that many residents have buying and renting. Many of my constituents are very concerned about home ownership for themselves and for their children. They ask why governments are not taking immediate action and cutting through the red tape that is holding up development. Speaker, can the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing explain how our strong mayor's legislation will result in more homes and provide reassurance to my constituents about their future in cities like Toronto? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thanks, Speaker. Uh, through you to the, to the member. I've said this many, many times in the House that we, we need to work with our municipal partners to unlock more housing supply. Too many Ontarians are worried, Speaker, that they're never going to be able to own the home that meets their needs and their budget. Our government has to move forward. We have to implement policies and build upon the success of more homes for everyone and our housing supply action plan. Speaker, I want to remind the members of the House that last year we had the most housing starts, over 100,000. It's the most we've had in our province in over 30 years. But Speaker, more has to be done. We need to pull out all the stops to ensure that municipalities have the tools to get the job done. We've committed to Ontario Fonts. in the last election that we're going to be building 1.5 million homes over the next 10 years so that people can realize the dream of home ownership. That's exactly what our proposed Strong Mayor's Bill will accomplish. The member for Humber River, Black Street. Thank you, Speaker. Buying a new home should be a dream, but not a nightmare. We continue to hear about bad builders who extort home buyers by raising the price of homes after contracts have been signed or turn around and cancel the contract and resell the home to the highest bidder. This has to stop. Your regulator, the HICRA, has only investigated 10% of all complaints and not a single fine has been laid. To make matters worse, because of the government regulators in action, many home buyers have had to spend thousands and thousands of dollars in court, sign NDAs, and go through years of unnecessary stress because your government regulator isn't protecting them. Why is this government letting this happen? And if they're not willing to act, are they willing to reimburse home buyers for their legal fees since they are unwilling to protect them? Here, here. Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Mr. Speaker, it is this government that vowed to stop bad developers from trying to make extra money off the backs of hardworking Ontarians. And it is our government that is strengthening the regulatory tools available to address this concern. Uh, speaker, these include much heftier fines for bad uh, builders and enhanced powers for HCRA to proactively investigate potential bad behavior by developers. Altogether, Mr. Speaker, these stronger penalties and approaches would cost unlawful developers very, very dearly on a single home from hundreds of thousands of dollars in fines to the loss of their builder's license. Mm -hmm. Speaker, we are making Response? bad builders think twice before trying to take advantage of our home buyers. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, Mr. Speaker, we are actively working to stop these incidences from happening any further through multiple different means. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. Government House Leader, point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just rising on uh, Standing Order uh, 59, just to outline uh, uh, the business in the coming week, and just to thank members again for uh, uh, a very uh, productive week on all sides of the House for uh, the people of the province of Ontario. So on Monday, September 5th, uh, pursuant to Standing Order 9I, the, the House, of course, will not meet in recognition of uh, Labor Day. On Tuesday, September 6th, in the morning, we will be dealing with, uh, in morning and afternoon, Bill 3, the Strong Mayors Building Homes Act, uh, uh, both morning and afternoon, and in the evening we will have a private member's uh, uh, notice of motion number two from the member uh, for Brampton North. Uh, on Wednesday, no, uh, Wednesday, September 7th, 
Uh, in the morning and afternoon, we will proceed with uh, Bill 3, Strong Mayors, Building Better, Building More Homes Act. Uh, in the evening, we will pro have the member of Scarborough Guildwood, Bill 9, uh, Safe uh, and uh, Healthy Communities Act. Uh, on uh, Thursday, September 8, uh, in the morning, colleagues, we will have tributes to uh, deceased members of Parliament. Uh, and let me just thank members who have been participating in that. Uh, they are uh, very important uh, to the family members, and the speeches on all sides have uh, really been uh, uh, very, very well done. So uh, thank you and congratulations to everybody. Um, we will then uh, have a, a statement by the ministry at routine proceedings. Uh, the Minister uh, of uh, Addictions and Mental Health uh, will have a statement on World Suicide Prevention Day. The afternoon, we will continue on with tributes to uh, deceased members of provincial parliament. And in the evening, uh, the, a, uh, the member for Windsor West Private Members Notice of Motion Number 1. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. With a deferred vote on the motion for third reading, a bill to an act to implement budget measures and to enact and amend various statutes. Call on the members. This will be a five-minute bell. <laughs>